Okay, thank you guys so much for coming to this TP tent structure. I know there's about 12 stages today, um, so we're really happy that you've joined us. So yeah, the name of the panel is The Institutions Are Coming. So a very optimistic approach to the ever-present question of are the banks going to join in the world of crypto? We've got a wonderful panel here, so before we kick off, just want to allow them to introduce themselves. Max, if you could kick us off, please. Hi, I'm Max Bone, and I run B2C2, one of the main market makers in the space. Uh, prior to that, I was, um, I was uh, an interest rate swap trader at Goldman Sachs, and I jumped ship in 2015 when I thought the fixed income market wasn't doing so hot and crypto was uh, on the up and up. Hi, yeah, I'm Mark. I'm uh, one of the co-founders at Tagomi, a digital agency electronic brokerage in the space. Uh, prior to that, I was actually an investor, so early investor in Algorand, Blockstack, Filecoin, and Zeppelin. Um, and yeah, we help people place larger trades on an agency basis. Hi, and I'm Simon. I work at Bitstamp. Um, prior to Bitstamp, I was an institutional investor myself, working at Oxford University Endowment for, for many years, and prior to that, Prudential Asset Management. Fantastic. So we're just having a quick chat backstage, um, and there are no contrarians here, no one who doesn't think the institutions are coming. Um, so I thought it would be helpful just to start by thinking about what we mean by institutions. Uh, it's a very broad term, one that's, I think, overly used perhaps in marketing. Um, so maybe, Max, you can just, because you deal with institutions a lot, maybe just expand a little bit on, on, the, on the confines of what we mean by institutions. Yes. Well, if there's going to be a contrarian today, it's going to be me, I think. Um, I think a lot of people in crypto don't really know what they're talking about, to be, to be frank. <laughs> and institutions, it's a big misnomer because there are so many institutions out there. It's a big space. Uh, and what people tend to forget is that I think all institutions, at the end of the day, cater to the needs of the general public. So it doesn't matter how many layers you have, but you, if you're a pension fund, at the end of the day, it's people like you and I putting their savings into pensions. If you're an insurer, you know, you're insuring some risk that at, at the end of the day is borne by, by, by retail, right? And so you've got also in, of institutions that cater to the needs of the general public, and it's not like there's a pool of money out there that sits outside of, the, of, of reality and, and that just, we're just waiting for them. In fact, a lot of institutions, and very big ones, are, are, are active in crypto right now. It just doesn't happen to be necessarily the ones that, that we've heard. Um, but coming from the prior to interest rate swaps, after the big swaps, um, if you look at the foreign exchange market, uh, for instance, Japan, 30% of the EFX book of a bank is basically Japan, right? And, but the names there, they're not well known. You know, you look at like a, GM, uh, sorry, a GMO, a DMM, and Hirose. Have you ever heard, heard, heard of those names? No, you haven't. Yet they're absolutely massive in FX. You look at a um, typical bank like, you know, a Barclays, a Goldman, every day in, in, in EFX, they do maybe 30, 40 billion dollars a day. The biggest brokers in the world, the retail FX brokers, they, do, they can do like 100 billion dollars. So they're bigger than banks. So they're absolutely monster, massive institutions, and they're active in crypto. We trade with them. 80% of my volume is with, with regulated um, um, institutions. But it's not something that you know the man on the street has, has heard of. But it's not because BlackRock is not in crypto right now that the institutions are not active. I'm sure BlackRock one day will be, but to me, it doesn't really matter when they come in, because there's who n the people that need to be in crypto, they're in crypto today. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely agree. I think, though, there's a distinction between sort of the trading institutions and the wealth managers. And it is the latter that will move prices. So generally, people really are very interested in when will BlackRock, when will asset managers come in. So I think it's very active on the trading side. Brokerages, FX firms, market makers are all you know, moving into the space, and they provide liquidity. But the other side of the house, the asset managers, frankly, are not in the space. So they're investing indirectly. So a good example is one of our largest investors is Paradigm. You know, they have Yale's endowment behind them and some really big asset managers. Another investor of ours is Morgan Creek, which has a couple pension funds. Um, Pantera and others are also investors, but they're all indirectly doing it through crypto funds and they're allocating very small amounts. So I think a lot of the public is very interested in when that asset management side comes in, because that's fundamentally what will drive price increases, which at the end of the day is what a lot of people care about. Um, so I think the trading side is really important for the liquidity, for the tools, um, to create a framework, especially a regulatory one to get folks in but we are all still sort of waiting on the asset manager side, and I don't think there's been a lot of direct involvement there. Yeah, and I think you've more or less exhausted the topic by the time it, by the time it gets <laughs> to me. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's true that the, most of the market is still retail-driven. There are institutions out there that are trading, but it's small, like small family office individuals or trading firms. 
when you talk about like the bigger institutions that are involved, it's the likes of something like a Swiss quote, which has a relationship with, with Bitstamp. They're providing bit, uh, uh, you know, crypto to their underlying retail customers and using Bitstamp as the, the institutional pool of liquidity. But then what we're, we are missing next is, as you say, when are the big ticket sizes coming rather than like individual traders? When is like, I mean, pensions and insurance companies are like, you know, that is, I don't know the percentage, but it's 70, something like 70% of all assets in the world. So those, they're the big ticket sizes that we're waiting to come in and we're just not quite there yet. We're at the stage of between retail and the big asset managers, you have the less regulated firms like uh, the family offices, foundations, endowments who are a bit more on the bleeding edge of investments. And again, they're not, some are investing a little bit directly, but otherwise they're going through indirect VC firms. So yeah, that's how I would view the, the landscape right now. And then from your conversations then <clears throat> with some of these bigger players, um, what would be your prediction, A, on when, if it's not a question of if, when these players are going to join or likely to join, and B, what are the hang-ups? Is this an ideological question or is this an infrastructure question that there's still massive variables missing in the space? Yeah, I mean, I'd say it's both. Um, if I'm, I'll, I'm just going first. Yes, <laughs> go, please go first. I don't want you feeling lonely. Uh, I mean, for me, this is a question of, of when, not if, because you know I believe in the fundamental value of, of, of Bitcoin and other cryptos. Um, but the, the hang-ups are, first of all, like regulation and infrastructure, which we maybe we can come on to that you know, in more detail. And then the second one is, is ideological. And if you, if you think about the decision makers of these big asset managers, um, they, they, they're skeptical of crypto and it doesn't fit within their current valuation frameworks. So there's no consensus of how to, to value crypto and it's also something that's a radical new alien technology. Whereas in five to 10 years, the decision makers at those firms will be people who think that Bitcoin is you know, a rather <laughs> normal and boring new asset class that they should be allocating to. So it'll take that, that generational shift of getting used to a new technology is one, is one element where it's no longer career risk to put your hand up and say to an investment committee, I think we should buy Bitcoin. Um, and then the other angle is the, the regulation and infrastructure to actually make that possible. Yeah, I think um, you need to see retail interest and real use cases for the larger asset managers. So there used to be quite a bit of push in late 2017 um, for Goldman's private wealth or other private wealth groups around the world to start really looking at it, and that push has gone away. So to a degree, I think it has to be dictated by, like Simon said, more family offices pushing the asset managers that they're really interested in it. Um, you know, on the Tagomi brokerage platform, we have family offices like the Bailey family is a client and investor. They run Cambridge Associates. Cambridge Associates has obviously encouraged more people to look at it. Um, but you need those family offices. You need things like ETFs where there's huge retail uh, desires coming out of it. But retail is going to have to push institutions here. And a lot of this recent price movement upward has not been by new entrants into the market. It's been the same entrants buying on pretty low liquidity. Um, so you do need kind of that retail push. And then the second is use case. I mean, there's a lot of very, very interesting projects. I've been investing in kind of the base protocol layers for four years now, um, seeding you know, companies like Algorand or Blockstack. But the reality is there are not large use cases in the space yet outside of Bitcoin as a store of value. Um, Ethereum is probably still the clear leader um, in the smart contract system, and there's a lot of changes going on there. And so there's a ton of excitement. Many of the projects are super cool, but honestly, they're more like seed stage companies um, than you know, large use cases. So I think the second thing is asset managers are not the dumb money. They're actually quite, quite smart money. Um, and they're waiting for a lot of use cases to actually be proven out, which is obviously what people in this room are doing, but it's, it's still very early days for them. So I think both retail interest and real use cases at scale are the things that would drive these larger asset managers. They're not gonna be taking a risk before either one of those things. I'm gonna be a lot more cynical. Um, there's a few buyers, obviously ideological. You use the example of Goldman. I can't say too much, but I think it's well known that Pablo Salame was quite against it. Uh, is gone now, so you know things you know got unlocked. Um, yet you still have other problems like suitability. Yeah? My first job, I was you know kind of working a lot with structured notes. It's not easy to sell structured notes. Can you imagine you know the suitability requirements to to sell Bitcoin to your to your um, your clients? It's not that easy. At the end of the day, though, I think it's a question of money. Um, the reason everyone was excited in 2017 is because they thought there was a lot of money to be made. Suddenly, Goldman was interested. What a surprise. And I, I were there. I'm uh, nothing against that. Um, but now that you know the market uh, has cooled down, that, that's not the case anymore. 
we have seen though that it picks up again. The institutions like the ones that, like asset managers are gonna come back. Back in the day when I left uh, the bank, they were trying to understand, hey, is there something to do there? And they asked their clients and all of their clients said, we have absolutely no interest. So that, that was kind of that killed it. Now, if we have a bubble again, the interest is gonna come back. And if there's money enough, uh, if there's enough money to be made, they will, they will jump in. There's no question of a doubt. So it's not, it's not really a question of uh, ideology or whatever, you know, all those concerns are overridden by, you know, a large amount uh, part of cash. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously banks, despite wanting to, to make money, are still confined by regulation, which you've touched on briefly. I mean, there, we know that this space is heavily under-regulated, and part of that is on purpose. There is a real tension between the community who don't want regulation or very limited regulation, and those who see that it is probably necessary to bring on the big players. Um, I know you guys have both stretched into the US, which is notoriously heavily regulated, uh, or, or rather has very stringent regulation for those who do get licenses like New York's bit license. Maybe you can talk a little bit about um, where you see regulation going and what, what fundamentals you think you, we need to see. Yeah, sure. So, you know, we um, are an agency brokerage. We're dealing with large clients. We have RIAs on the platform, family offices, large VCs. Um, so we went ahead and applied for the bit license and got it in seven months, which I think was the fastest time anyone got a bit license. Um, you know, we can operate in 20 states in the U.S., here in the U.K., in Hong Kong. Um, for me, it's not no regulation, more regulation. What I'd really like to see is consistent regulation. So even in the US on a state-by-state -state basis, do you need an MTL? Do you not need an MTL? What do you need to get an MTL? Uh, we're for accredited investors only. There's a def different definition in Hong Kong of what an accredited investor is than in the US. And so you know, we have two former attorneys from the SEC who work for us, our GC and our chief compliance officer. We've had to invest really heavily in regulation, and we got lucky. We, you know, we have 28 million from Founders Fund and Paradigm, so we're able to support um, being able to be regulatory compliant. But honestly, it's quite prohibitive for most startups or most companies a year old like us. Um, and so I think what's really important is not so much should there be more or less regulation, even though maybe on the kind of privacy coin that's a separate question, but consistent regulation, even within jurisdictions like the US, would be you know, greatly appreciated by companies like ours and would let more people, I think, enter the space in a more compliant way. Um, yeah, um, I, I think that there's, there's a bit of a problem in the space and a risk that the startups uh, disappear and are replaced by larger institutions. Um, you know, we touched about, is there a, a big enough amount of cash that will prompt them to do so? You know, a lot of banks had a terrible year last year in XFX, absolutely terrible. Some banks had zero PL over the entire year, it was quite terrible. So if they think that they can get into crypto, they will. And the problem is that I think they will take over once that's the case, because you look at the foreign exchange market, historically the cash market isn't regulated. There is no regulation around the cash market in effect, in particular in the UK. Th the only regulation you have is around it. So you've got, you know, well, some stuff around best execution, you know, client money, things like that, but the trading itself is unregulated. Now, the problem you have in crypto is that if you want to be regulated as a trading business, you can't. I, you know, I think of Bitstamp, Bitstamp as a payments license, not an exchange license, never will get an exchange license because <laughs> it's not a MIFID financial instrument. So, you know, unless crypto suddenly becomes a financial instrument, and I think we're a long way away from that, BitTime's not gonna have an exchange license. I have the same problem. I've got a regulatory license, I can offer OTC derivatives in crypto, so I do that, that's regulated, that's great, but the cash trading itself is not regulated and will not be for a long time. So when you want to show good creden regulatory credentials, if you trade crypto, there's really nothing you can show unless you, you get regulated sort of, sort, of, sort of by proxy. Now, for the banks, that's not a problem because they're so big and they're regulated under so, so many remits that if they come into crypto, they will have absolutely absolutely no problem. I mean, obviously on the payment side, they're banks, so they're gonna do their payments without a problem. That's still to this day one of the main, main problems in the space is that it's difficult to get bank accounts. Um, and so all the things that are not regulated in crypto, when we wish could be regulated, also all the, the, the services that professional firms like auditors provide, you know, do you want to audit my crypto firm? No, obviously if you're a large player, you just strong arm them into regulating your crypto business. So I look at, um, well actually, you know, you look at eToro, IG, those are big names in the UK, they're, they're audited by the big four, they started crypto businesses and they just told the auditors, look, 
If you don't audit my crypto business, that's the end of the relationship. And what do the auditors do? They cave in. But you're a startup, you want to get an audit by EY, good luck with that. So I think that the incumbents have a, they have a strong advantage there. And so it's a, actually quite a big risk for the, the startups and incumbents. I think right now we're possibly in a sort of Goldilocks environment where there isn't too much money to be made, but still you know, enough, to, enough to, to have good business. And so it's good. If Bitcoin goes to 50,000, I think we have to be very careful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as you've... Um as you mentioned, Bitstamp and, uh, and regulation. So, I mean, one of the reasons why Bitstamp has tried to pursue the regulated path from a very early stage, when the first exchange to be licensed, yeah. was to get access to those other services. I mean, so I mean, the goal of Web3 is to be a decentralized internet and decentralized organizations and governance. But in the meantime, money's got to flow into that economy. And it can only do that if you interact with the existing financial ecosystem. So that's the, that's the kind of intermediate stage we're, we're at and the important service that Bitstamp's trying to provide. And so I, Bitstamp tried to get regulated in, in the UK and they, they turned us down because, look, we don't have a license to give you. Like, what are you going to be re regulated as? But, we, but what we needed to do was comply with all the processes that already exist so that we could get those services, particularly have a strong, stable banking relationship network so that you know, retail traders and institutions can be comfortable with us and know they can get money in and out. So that's the, that's the reason why we're pursuing that regulated path and the important function that, that we play in that, in that ecosystem. Um, so regulation is, is helpful and it provides that clarity, but it's the double-edged sword that it does kill some of the more innovative, especially web 3.0 stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, so we've been regulated in, in Europe as a money transmitter and then the US has got a bit license, we've got that and we're rolling those out. Um, it's just, just the stage we're at in the market, um, yeah. And if you were to rank the next biggest roadblock, what would it, what would it be? With regulation? For, for institutions, it's then yeah. the other services that they're used to. So, I mean, this is a completely different asset from what, a digital bearer asset is very different from all the other securities, commodities, whatever else they're used to trading. And so you have to provide in those particular wrappers where you have the, you know, even for, for an exchange, we need to have like the, the fixed APIs that traders are used to dealing with, not, not directly at the exchange. We need to have like co-location. We we're upgrading our matching engine. So it's not like crypto exchanges built their own matching engines, but you need to have the matching engines that other exchanges use. And then beyond that, you need the, I mean, maybe Mark should talk about like the, the, you know, the cost clearing and settlement, which is the next important. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, we were pretty shocked when we started at the beginning of 2018 that there really wasn't an electronic agency brokerage because that's how 80% plus, you know, of equity buying is done. So it was still being done on OTCs. If you were more sophisticated, you could plug into a market maker, but there really wasn't an agency brokerage that was doing everything in an automated way with advanced algos. And so my co-founder, Greg, he was the global head of electronic trading at Goldman for 12 years and uh, sold his previous company to them. And so, you know, we were just kind of really surprised that that didn't exist. And there were a lot of investors, even venture funds, who wanted to be able to access crypto and couldn't do it in a brokerage way. And so a really big missing piece, like Simon mentioned, was to be able to trade across exchange, trade across market makers, but then settle and clear your trades. And so at first you had Noble Bank, which had sort of the first version of that. Now you have Silvergate and Signature. Um, but even those, you need somebody to sort of navigate for you. So we work with a group of banking partners across the world to kind of do settlement and clearing of those trades um, across the different exchanges. And so even something as basic, it's not a super innovative idea. There are people out there creating the next level of decentralized finance, you know, which is super cool. But it was interesting that there wasn't even really an agency electronic brokerage out there, how most people buy stocks. And so mm -hmm. I think on the settlement and clearing side, on the brokerage side, um, being able to lend, short, trade on margin, all in really safe, secure ways um, with well-known counterparties. You know, none of that stuff really exists. And that's because the market is still very, very retail with, you know, to be fair, kind of these brokerages and other platforms that can sit on top of retail, folks like Square and SoFi in the U.S. coming into the space. Um, but it's still very retail driven and trading driven. And so for asset managers who are used to tools like brokerages or settlement and clearing functionality, um, that's just been missing. And so it's been exciting to build out some of the first versions of that. So, so we know that <coughs> there are a lot of institutions who are still very cynical, who still see this as a shady space, underworld, however you want to phrase it. I'm sure you're used to giving pitches uh, where you're trying to convince uh, and relay some of the, the brighter parts of this, of this um, space. I mean, the FT has, I don't know if you guys have seen it, a dedicated blog, Al Alphaville, essentially, to, um, to, to keep my language appropriate, um, dismissing some of the crypto, uh, you know, 
features. Mm -hmm. So how do you convince people, cynics, real cynics, that this is a space that is to be trusted, that regulators can trust, and that they can, they can invest money in sensibly? I'll speak to that, actually. Um, condescendingly earlier, I said that a lot of people don't have any idea what they're doing. My two colleagues here really do. Um, so I commend them for the work that they're doing. Um, and, and early on, I think a lot of people understood, uh, but it was a minority, that there's a few things that you need to put in place. I, I made a speech almost two years ago now at Consensus that we needed custody. That became very hard, but I thought that was really a non-issue. It's really a solved problem. And then um, clearing or credit and, s and funding. So credit and funding, I think, are the, the two main issues that we're, we need to tackle. And I guess uh, Tagami in particular is, is looking at that. Um, now, someone who doesn't really have an idea what they're doing is the main, the main writer for Alpha Billion Crypto. I, I really think she doesn't know what she's talking about, unfortunately. Uh, Isabella Kaminska. Yeah. Um, I'm really sorry, but uh, that's to be out. said. <laughs> <laughs> um, Follow her on Twitter, I guess. Personally, um, my approach is completely the opposite. I am a blockchain skeptic, but I think that there's something to do in crypto. Um, it just so happens that we need to put in place something that looks exactly like conventional markets. So you need to have all those, you know, facilities that we talked about, and then the institutions will be, will be interested because it's just going to make their life easier. At the moment, the institutions that are present is the one, are the ones that have an immediate need because their client base wants to, and so it's th they make the effort of, oh, God, I need to get a crypto wallet. How do I do that? Well, guess what? IG Market years ago got you know, a crypto wallet because they needed to. Same for eToro. Now you, know, you have more plug-and-play solutions you can have, uh, and so it makes it a little bit easier for people to get in. Now, in terms of being cynical, I think that's just posturing, to be honest. Um, the underlying business case is strong um, as long as there's enough money to be made. So we've got a very aggressive pitch here. Simon, maybe you can give us another kind of pitch. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't think that it's my job or any of our jobs to try and convince a cynical person to buy Bitcoin. Not at this. We're still in like the <laughs> venture stage of a new asset class, which is something that hasn't really happened before. Um, so when it comes to someone like Isabel, I mean, I, I stopped following her years ago, uh, just but not because I didn't. I thought she was stupid. I think you know she's a very smart woman, uh, but her job is like is to be a financial journalist and to be critical to the very end. Like I mean, I'm sure she was writing negative things about Facebook and Amazon, even maybe even now. Um, so her job isn't to like you know shill and, and pump Bitcoin. Um, but what I think is that there is that, th as I went to before, I think there's that generational mind shift change that needs to happen over many years in which an asset class becomes normal. And I think once you get to the point where there's ac academic literature on Bitcoin that you can read and you, everyone can agree what the valuation, the subjective valuation models are, like the D DCF analysis. Like why does everyone value stocks the same way, use the same discount rates? It's just because for some reason that academic literature has evolved and, and everyone has this subjective consensus. So I just think we just keep doing our job, keep building it, and, and eventually the world will come along with us. Okay, I'll yeah. say. Oh, I was just gonna say, yeah, just it's generally use cases, right? So there were a lot of people very cynical of the internet and all the dot com stocks in the late nineties, and they were actually kind of right. But at the end of the day, you know, four or five companies that came out of that cycle are now the most used companies in the world. So frankly, she's right. You know, ninety percent of things are bad or not good or not viable, but it's up to the ten percent that are real projects to scale and kind of prove them wrong. So let's go five, maybe ten years into the future when the institutions all of them, um, the big ones, let's say, are here. I know you said you don't, you're not particularly bothered whether or not they come, but let's say, let's talk about what the impacts could be beyond price, obviously, elevation. Mm -hmm. What, in your utopia of an institutionalized crypto world, are you most excited about? Do you think we're most in need of with institutions coming on board, or is it very much just the price and, the, and for you guys, the customers? The market's gonna look very different. Uh, you're gonna have a clearing infrastructure like CLS-type businesses. You're gonna have um, people that have retail flow trading directly with electronic OTC market makers. With some aggregators, not too many, because in FX we've seen that if you aggregate too much, you get worse prices, okay? I, I, th the space is not like even five years away from, I mean, it's just like they have no idea for now. Uh, but we're going to get into those issues later on. Um, and then the people that have very short-term aggressive alpha, they will trade on exchange because no OTC market maker will show them prices. It's going to be exactly what we have today, be it in FX or, uh, or, or you know, rates, electronic trading, or, whatever, or even equities. The equity market being a bit different because of Reg MS in the US, it's very exchange-centric. But that, you know, we tend to think about the trading venue as exchanges, but that's a very US equities thing. Like most of the trading actually doesn't happen on exchange. It's just that there's regulation in the US that forces trading on exchange. But outside of that, there is really 
you know, not that much need for, don't, don't want to say that in front of Bitstamp, not that there's no need for exchanges, but it's the aggressive sort of shock traders that go on exchange. Everyone else trades OTC, and that's always going to be in five years in crypto. So it's going to look exactly like the conventional markets, but it's quite different from what we have right now. Like a tag me that well, everyone thinks, oh, that's so new, but actually it's an old idea. You know, Greg Tussar, I mean, he didn't, it's not reinventing the wheel. It's just that not a lot of people, when you look at early crypto adopters, the, the guys that got rich by investing in 2012, um, they didn't know that that's how the real world looks like. So they didn't foresee that, didn't prepare for this. And now you have professionals are coming in doing what other people couldn't see. Yeah, I don't know if it's in five years, but I'd love to see those institutions actually engaging in the protocol layers, the applications on top of them. I think that would be you know, really, really interesting beyond just speculating on the tokens. And so, so you mean invest in as well? Yeah, investing in it, but also using smart contract systems. So I'd love insurance companies to use smart contract systems and interact with them versus counterparties in a decentralized world. So I think that the first layer is, OK, how do we get them, exactly like Simon said, how do we build the ramp to get a lot of the dollars and institutional assets into crypto? But then I think where the largest opportunities lie, and this is outside of what Tagomi is doing, but where the largest opportunities lie is once they've come over that uh, ramp, you know, can they actually be engaging and using smart contract systems with counterparties and participating on top of protocols um, and you know, utilizing the application layer and needing utility tokens for that, needing underlying protocol tokens in order to come onto that ramp. So I think that would be a world that was kind of what everyone, I think, is trying to build more so than just a speculative piece. I'm very skeptical. Uh, my first about Goldman, I was running the Trap Party repo book in London. Um, huge balance sheet, you're talking $100 billion. Um, collateral allocation to OTC derivative, things like that. There's absolutely no way that that infrastructure can be put on a blockchain because it relies so much on credit. If you have a smart contract that says this person owes this and this person owes that, the only way to make it work in a trustless fashion is to have everything to be fully pre-funded. And it just doesn't work. Because when you look at real derivatives and the huge exposures that we have, I, was, I remember uh, Goldman and Deutsche had like a 10 billion OTC payable to one another. Um, you know, you're taking $10 billion of treasuries, you get, you're putting them in as collateral for the CSA, then Deutsche on the other side is taking those 10 billion and collateralizing some other CSA with it. The only way to do that is if you have actual credit relationships. If you put it on a smart contract, once you, know, once you send the $10 million of treasuries, assuming you can put them on a blockchain, they have to be blocked there. Because if, if they can be re-hypothecated, then there's, you know, it's not trustless because you have a credit issue. Well so I personally don't we'll think that it can we'll happen. We'll stick Sorry. to crypto for now, yes, but S Simon, if you yeah. could. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree that I think that the, the institutions make crypto look like any other asset that they're currently trading. Um, and, you know, it's a speculative investment in some kind of security, commodity, cash, gold technology. Um, and I think that's the kind of first step. But, like, the future goal then is actually that I think that, like, crypto changes the institutions because now it actually empowers individuals to, like, hold their own assets and to engage in this you know, connected digital global internet system. Um, so I, I, I think that th that's what institutions will do because that's all they, all they can do with it. But like, actually, it need, this stuff needs to be used. It's a bit like you know, when um, you know, an institution starts buying commodities, like useful commodities as a speculative purpose or buys real estate, stuff that actually belongs in the hands of people and companies actually doing stuff. So I think that institutions make it look like everything else, but that's just a stepping stone to businesses and companies getting engaged in the um, in the digital ecosystem, or Web3. And then as a counter, I know you spent time working at Oxford in the university, so you've spent a lot of time around kind of, I guess, ideologues and anti-establishment groups. Um, and I've met lots of crypto purists um, since I joined the space. Is there is there an argument that the ethos of crypto um, being potentially anti-establishment, challenging some of the um, monopoly, perhaps, of some of these big institutions, is that in danger if we welcome if we celebrate their their universal adoption of this um, y yeah I mean it, it does kind of take some of the edge away um, but maybe ultimately less, less sexy all of them yeah well the thing is like Bitcoin like Bitcoin already is boring for people in the crypto <laughs> ecosystem and it's going to be boring for the average person soon like you hope that if it succeeds if it becomes boring um, but um, I, I think that I don't think that institutions can do anything to take away the fact that these are digital bearer assets, and once they're in the hands of an individual in your wallet, you can do stuff with it. Mm. So I don't think that it that it will. It'll only help 
adoption, I think. If it, if it, first of all, we need to create the store of value so that these things have a lot of value, and then you can create the utility. Mm -hmm. Max, closing remarks? I fully agree. Fantastic, consensus. Thank you so much um, for joining us, and I hope you enjoyed the panel.